Hey everyone, Allie Dameron here. In today's video, I wanna talk about how technology has impacted women's health and hormones. If you have not hit the subscribe button yet, hit that button to be notified anytime I post new content related to women's health, hormones, or holistic health. So I'm a big fan of technology. I just wanna first mention that, but I think that it's important to be open to the effects that it's giving us both the good and the bad because we know that with almost everything, technology included, there are both pros and cons to all of it. So it's definitely revolutionized the way that we've lived from smartphones to social media. Technology has, you know, really had such a profound impact on our lifestyle, how we live our life. And if we, in just really such a short amount of time too, like, we um, you know, have only had smartphones for such a short amount of time, but yet we have gotten really used to it and comfortable. My husband and I have a Telluride that we got a couple of years ago that has like the backup camera, obviously, and it also has like beeps and all kinds of different things. And when we drive our older car from about 10 years ago, we both get really nervous now. We like drove those cars for a really long time, but we're both like, you're very reliant on this new technology to help us even like drive safer and things like that. And so it just shows it's really been eye opening to both of us that like how fast our brains have gotten adapted and just used to this new technology. And I think that, you know, we all can relate to that in various aspects of our life from just being so interconnected to social media to AI technology to, you know, just different apps and all the things, right? So um, it's it's interesting to kind of think back to before those things existed, how, how that was. Um, and I think a lot of us can't really even imagine it. So first, technology has obviously made life more convenient. We can access information, entertainment, communication very, very easily within just like a few clicks. Think about even just like directions, right? Like we used to have to like write out the directions on the pen and paper, or we'd have to like really focus on the directions that somebody was giving us. And now we're just like, okay, yeah, I'll be there. And we just plug it in our smartphone and be on our way, which is amazing. It's made life so much easier and more convenient for all of us. However, one of the pitfalls of that is that it's also made life a lot more sedentary, especially I think with the COVID pandemic, we also, you know, if you think about it, got some different technologies and just a few different ways of life, right? Like curbside pickup and more delivery options and things like that, um, that really were sped up in my opinion by the, the COVID pandemic. Um, we definitely are more sedentary the rise of remote work. We don't have to commute anymore, which is a positive thing, I think, for a lot of people that they don't have to. Sitting in our car every day was not necessarily ideal either. But we also had to walk in our office, walk to our desk, walk further to the bathroom. We just did get up a little bit more than just like moving to our living room. Um, and so I think that, you know, a lot of us spend hours upon hours upon hours each day just sitting in front of screens and this has led to a lot of physical inactivity i think um you know i was talking to a friend the other day who works remotely and works has a pretty like you know intense job where she's in front of the computer a lot and she can get like a thousand to two thousand steps a day which we know is not nearly enough and you've probably heard the phrase of like sitting is the new smoking like our bodies are meant to get up and move um, and so that can lead to a lot of health problems. And I've talked about this a lot on social media, but there's been numerous studies out in the last few months about the benefits of NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So basically saying movement outside of our normal formal exercise routine. So walking, moving, cleaning, getting up and down with kids, going to the grocery store, putting away laundry, like mowing the grass, like all of these things have a lot of profound impact on our bodies, both good and bad, depending on how many we get. So there is different studies for different things, but we found that around 8,200 to 10,000 steps plus 
really do inc or decrease our risks of things like heart disease, cancers, digestive issues, good for mental health, good for cortisol and nervous system dysregulation, stress response stuff, good for sex hormones, insulin resistance and blood sugar regulation, good for brain health to prevent things like Alzheimer's and dementia, cholesterol levels, like the list really does go on and on and on with the benefits of simply just moving. The other thing is technology has changed the way that we interact with each other. And again, both for the positive and the negative. The positives are we can stay in touch very easily with friends and family. We're able to share information and pictures and videos and things like that. And, th you know, be able to see things and keep in touch with people that we previously probably would have no idea what, what happened to them from like previous parts of our life or whatever. However, it's also created a lot of cyberbullying. People are very brave behind screens to say whatever they feel like saying a lot of times that they would never say to somebody's true face. And I think just the comparison trap, I think the overload of information, I'm not convinced that our brains have evolved in a way of being able to intake the amount of information that we're given. We um, you know, can get scary news very readily available in lots of it, whereas we used to have to sort of get that in doses with like the newspaper, the evening news, those sort of things. Um, and I was actually just talking to a colleague about this earlier today about just information in general. And I had given a presentation last week to her retreat group and um it was about stress and hormones and things like that and she was like i think you did you know like a really good job about simplifying it and not getting really really deep in the weeds of the science around it because sometimes that can make people who are not interested in that really glaze over which i understand and i said you know even for me like it's interesting on social media i follow certain people who have a lot of science on their feed and I like it, but it's also very almost like dysregulating or like disorienting to scroll like Facebook or Instagram where there's so many different topics like right after one another. So like one person might be picture a uh, picture of her kids and then a funny meme and then a dancing reel and then like this really deep intense science about something hormonally or whatever because I tend to follow people like that and then back to like a funny reel and then something sad that happened and so it's just kind of like emotional whiplash um to like get just bombarded with that much information and I do think in addition which we'll talk about that in a second in addition to like some of the blue light concerns that people that we do I do think that it can create some nervous system dysregulation so uh, I do think that apps and the phone was not created by mistake. I think that they are intentionally very addictive. Apps definitely are. App creators want to keep you on their platform as long as possible through the algorithm and things like that, which is a whole other can of worms that we can chat about. But I do think that it is highly addictive and I do think that as time goes, we'll start to kind of understand a little bit more. I think we're first starting to now understand the effects of it on brain health. I think we'll continue to see different impacts of that as we go. And then the algorithm, of course, can be incredibly detrimental for feeding our confirmation biases, right? Because the things that we interact with is what the algorithm is going to give us more of. And so we are less apt to see other people's opinions and learn. We just get more and more confirmation that our own biases are true, which can create a lot of issues politically and just information bias, honestly. So I think that that also is a bit of a detriment to society. Um, and we've seen that not to get into it too much, but we've seen that, you know, in elections and politically and things like that too. So we definitely know that that's a thing and that there's been a lot of talk about how to deal with that, what, what that needs to look like. And I'm not going to get into that here, but it is a topic that should be considered for sure. Um, and I think from a more like personal standpoint, I really do think just like the self-recognition of that and the self-awareness that that is what's happening. You're getting basically one point of view because that is what your algorithm wants you to see because that is how you're going to stay on the app longer and longer and longer. If you start to see things that maybe you don't agree with, that's going to get you off of the app more. And so if you can just 
you know, get things that you like and agree with, you're going to stay on there longer and longer. And that is going to further basically root those beliefs in your brain. And so, you know, I think that that's an interesting concept in terms of just brain health and how our brain works as well. But I also think that we know, um, through social media, the good and the bad, one of the negative impacts of it is just the mental health impacts, especially for our children who have underdeveloped prefrontal cortexes, which is logical thinking, emotional regulation, executive functioning skills, those types of things. It's tough. There's a lot of like the comparison trap. There's a lot of cyberbullying. There's a lot of, you know, kids feeling left out or feeling inadequate, less than all of those things. And so I think just as parents, we need to be very cognizant of that and careful about what that looks like. And again, I think that as time goes, we'll continue to evolve in the science of what's actually happening and how to manage that, how to regulate that with our kids. But I also think that, you know, kids have an underdeveloped brain, but I also think that adults struggle with it just almost as much. So Adults can be cyber bullied as well. If you've ever been friends with an influencer or something like that, you know that there are a lot of like really hard comments that they receive, again, that people would never say to their face. They just can hide behind a screen and say it, which can have major impacts to mental health. And, you know, we talk a lot on this channel about the connection of your brain to your body and just kind of like that fight or flight response and stress and things like that and all the impacts that it can have physically on us. And so I do think that social media can increase the risks of things like anxiety, depression, bullying, you know, and all of those kind of scarier mental health things as well. And then one other thing that can happen is the phone is addictive, right? We know that it gives us a big dopamine hit, especially looking at our likes and our comments and all of that stuff. We've definitely shown that in science that that is what's happening and it does feel exciting. And so one thing that's happening is we are it, this phone, these apps are like our little sidekick. And so a lot of people will use this as sort of like empty self care. So we are just so exhausted by the end of the day and we just like numb out scrolling the phone. Um, and it does sort of like one of two things. It's not really self care because like I said, you're just kind of numbing out one and two. I would venture to guess very few of us leave social media feeling good about ourselves. Most of the time, the longer you scroll, you're going to start to be like, oh my gosh, they're doing more than I am. They're skinnier. They're prettier. They're more perfect. Their house is better. Their cars are better. They're doing this. They're going on this big trips. Like the comparison trap, the um, feelings of unworthiness, those types of things are very prevalent, I think, on social media. And so I think most of us leave feeling that. Uh, which is a negative thing. And then also, like I said, we're not truly filling our bucket because we're just numbing out because we're so exhausted from our daily life that we are just scrolling. The other aspect of that is like the blue light aspect. So these devices, screens, tablets, phones, all of the things emit blue light from them. And what that means is your eyes have little receptors in there which tell your brain what time of day it is. So the blue light tells your brain, oh, it's daylight, stop producing melatonin. So if you're in bed scrolling, your brain is getting this message that it's daytime, don't produce melatonin, which is our nice sleep hormone, but it also is like a nice antioxidant. It has a myriad of other benefits for our body besides just sleep. And our sleep issues have become more and more rampant as well. So if you are somebody who is scrolling the phone before bed, being on tablets, computers, etc. consider eliminating that it's from your life for like 30 to 60 to even science says 90. I know that's really tough. 90 minutes before bed. If you can't do that, at least put blue lock, blue light blocking glasses on or like a um, filter. There's all kinds of different options for this now, but Put something that's going to block that blue light so that you don't get low melatonin from it and have impacts with your sleep because I think that's a huge detriment also of technology. Overall, you guys, I think technology is amazing. I think we can do amazing things with it. It's allowed me to create a business, connect with so many amazing business owners and so many amazing patients. So I literally couldn't be more grateful for it. It really is incredible. 
I think the biggest aspect of this is that we just need to be mindful. We need to be mindful about who we're following, the amount of content that we're consuming, which content we're consuming, how many hours we're doing it. I think just putting in some strong boundaries for ourselves around it and also the self-awareness of how we're leaving social media. If we're leaving it feeling crappy and bad about ourselves every time we leave, we need to make sure that we're following people that are serving us well and not contributing to those types of feelings, misinformation, lack of information. Like there's just so many different aspects to it. So you just want to make sure that you're being very self-aware of the content you're consuming. Is it based on reality? Is it making you feel good? Is it a positive attribute to your life or is it something else? Um, and if it's something else, you know, even if it's friends, family, etc., you can mute people without actually unfollowing them. You can unfriend people. You can block people like Use those device or use those parts of social media to your own benefit to make social media a more positive place for yourself. I think that's a huge thing. Um, and I also think teaching that to your kids is another really positive thing as well. So I hope this was helpful for you guys. I have a brand new free on-demand training called How to Increase Energy and Get Fewer Mood Swings by Balancing Your Hormones without adding to your already too full plate. In this training, I teach you how to stop snapping at your family all the time and how to feel cool, calm, and collected all day long. I teach you what your doctor might be missing in terms of your hormonal health and your symptoms. And I also teach you how to have better moods, sleep, periods, and energy levels by really understanding what is the primary driver of these things. You can go to alliedameron.com forward slash training. I'll leave that link in the description below, but totally free on demand. You can listen to it while the kids are at soccer practice or you're driving or doing laundry, whatever. Um, and I would love to have you just get this information out. It's like I said, my primary mission in life is to simplify hormone health and educate and empower women on their, their bodies, their health, how to feel better. So go check that out and I'll see you guys over in the next one.